Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be making a video on Google Faps. Oh, sorry, I was thinking about something from earlier. Today we're going to be making a video on Google Maps and uh, it is going to be a long one, so get some popcorn, sit back, and enjoy the show. Okay, so uh, as most of you know, uh, Google Maps is a service that you use to get from one place to the other. Uh, I would imagine just about everyone watching this video has probably heard of it, unless you're living in China, in which case you probably don't have YouTube in the first place, so you're probably not living in China. Anyways, Google Maps, like I mentioned, one place to the other. So one route that I happen to take very frequently is from my house to Sydney Sweeney's house. We're good friends. And uh, it takes 26 minutes to get there, and here's the route from start to finish. And Google Maps is going to tell me the directions to get there. So note that there's an ETA, and note that there is a route as well. So in order to formalize these problem requirements, let's turn them into three different statements. The first is that we obviously want to get the quickest possible route between two arbitrary locations. Now the truth is, Google Maps isn't always going to give you the quickest possible route. It's going to make a trade-off between finding you the best possible route and also getting you good latency in terms of figuring out what route to take. So uh, worth noting that there. The second thing is that we want to be able to provide an ETA for this route. And the third thing is that as things like traffic or weather or anything like that change, we want to be able to incorporate that into an updated ETA. Cool. So hopefully that makes a decent amount of sense. Okay, the next section I'm gonna call capacity notes. The reason being that I'm not actually going to blatantly estimate anything too serious here, but I'm gonna provide some baseline figures and you know maybe you can run with them to, to get a sense of the type of scale we're actually gonna be working with here. So let's imagine our system as a massive uh, graph, right, of nodes and edges, because that's basically what a road system is. We've got a bunch of roads, which are edges, and then a bunch of different places, which are nodes. And frankly, some of the intersections might be nodes as well, because any time that uh, you, know, you can go from one road to another road, we probably want a node representing the fact that uh, there are multiple edges connected to it. So if we decided to model our problem where every single intersection is an edge, every single highway exit is, uh, sorry, every single intersection is going to be a node, and every single uh, highway uh, exit is going to be a node, and every single place or address is also going to be a node on our map, then all of the roads that we can take between those are going to be edges. And so for what it's worth, uh, just doing some quick Googling, there are about 16 million intersections in the USA alone, there's about 200 million places in the USA alone. If we wanted to scale that up, that would probably mean that we are looking at like 50 billion different nodes on our map, and then you've got tons of roads connecting them as well. So again, like I said, I'm not going to do any sort of particular capacity estimate here because it would be super hand wavy. The point is we have a crap ton of data and for all of these nodes in our graph and for all of these edges, we're going to need a decent amount of metadata their latitude, their longitude, an ID, potentially a name, uh, things like that, uh, the travel time that it takes to actually go uh, from one road to another. And so basically the gist is that uh, the only reason I say this is because our graph is very, very unlikely going to be fitting on a single partition. I'm not gonna try and estimate how many partitions we're gonna need. We're gonna need a lot, but uh, it does tend to complicate things when we can't fit everything on one partition, and that I think is worth noting. Cool. So the first thing that I'm going to do is actually do a quick overview of Dijkstra's algorithm because uh, for those of you who have not thought about this one in a while, and I wouldn't blame you, it rarely comes up in our day-to-day -day jobs, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm is one of those types of lead code problems that you probably just have to know. So if I have a starting point on a graph and I have an ending point on a graph, Dijkstra's algorithm basically says we're going to iterate through all of the nodes in this graph, splitting them into three different types of areas. We basically are going to have a settled set, which is basically saying, okay, if this node is in the settled set, I know the shortest path from the start to that node. We also have the frontier set, which is basically saying, okay, I've seen this node, but I'm not sure if I've seen the shortest path for it. And then there's also the unvisited set, which is saying basically I haven't encountered that node in my graph just yet. So for every single iteration of uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, basically we're gonna start with the start point and say, all right, well obviously the start point is zero distance from the start. That's simple enough. Now what we're gonna do is put this in the frontier. And then from there, 
we're going to take the element of the frontier at every iteration that is closest to the start point, which on the first iteration is going to be the start. We're going to find all of the edges that connect to other points from that current point, right? So in this case, those edges are going to be this guy over here, this guy over here, this guy over here. So now we're looking at B, C, and D, right? So we're putting B, C, and D into our frontier. We're putting the start point A over here into our settled set. We know zero is the shortest distance to it. And then now on our next iteration, we basically say, okay, this guy is our frontier which is going to be our current node that we're about to put in the settled set, we would actually use some sort of uh, ordering where we basically take the node that has the shortest distance to the starting point. So if you recall, uh, note that B has a distance of two, C has a distance of four, and D has a distance of six. So that means B is going to be the next node that we take. And from there, we now look at all of the edges out of B. So from B, we're gonna add C again to the frontier set. It's already there. However, note that the distance to C going through B is actually only three, whereas it was four before. So now we update C to have a distance of three. D maintains its distance of six. And then also now all of a sudden, we know that we can get to E, but it's got a distance of 10. So that's gonna be our frontier set. And we basically keep going through updating all of our distances in the frontier set and pulling out the element of the frontier set that is closest to the start point until we eventually finish and reach the distance at the endpoint. So of course, the time complexity of this algorithm is going to depend on our implementation. Basically, how we're actually going to model the frontier set. We can use something like an array list, we can use something like a priority queue, and these all definitely are going to have trade-offs. But the point is, as the number of vertices and edges change in our graph, as they increase, Dijkstra's algorithm is going to become a lot slower. And this is something that is important to note. The reason being that let's say I want to go ahead and find the distance from myself over here in New York, and then I want to find the shortest path over here in let's say Oklahoma. For those of you who are not living in the United States, this is my very poorly drawn map of the United States. Hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. But in reality, these are thousands of miles apart. And the problem with that is that when you have to traverse thousands of miles and you have tons of nodes and tons of edges that you have to consider, Dijkstra's algorithm is simply not going to be feasible. You need to do something better than that. We need to be able to minimize the search space, right? And only basically consider certain roads which are very clearly going to get us closer to our target and not consider all of these very short roads and these back roads and things like that. So the next thing that I'm going to bring up as a concept is something that Google Maps actually does which officially is dubbed contraction hierarchies. So the idea here is we can basically do two things to reduce the search space for our Dijkstra's algorithm. The first thing is that we can basically just straight up remove certain edges, right? If I look at this edge here from node A to node C down on the bottom, I can just get rid of it. It's not the fastest path between A and C. And in addition to that, no one else actually uses it. So getting rid of it really has no cost to us, but keeping it, makes us have to consider it in Dijkstra's algorithm, which is bad, we don't want to do that. So we wanna get rid of unimportant edges. Another thing that we can actually do is get rid of certain nodes and edges entirely by creating something known as shortcut edges. So a shortcut edge is effectively just going to be a cached edge between two different points. And we can create one whenever we're removing certain other roads or certain other uh, points uh, connecting those roads. So for example, we could create a shortcut edge right here of uh, length four, because we know that uh, basically, you know, getting rid of all of these intermediary nodes is not really going to affect our traversal. And so the issue with contraction hierarchies is they're definitely not simple, right? Like uh, this is something that a lot of research goes into. There's no perfect heuristic for how to reduce your search space. But ideally, the general gist is that you want to end up having a bunch of edges which are you know, important, and basically the majority of routes are ultimately going to be going through, right? So for example, if I know that a certain uh, road is going to be very fast and is going to lead me to my destination a lot of the time, and it's also going to help other people get to their destination a lot of time, we probably wanna keep it. A good example of that would be a highway. Generally speaking, if you have a bunch of traffic lights, that's gonna be slow because you have to stop at them all the time, but highways are generally faster and a lot of people use them. So this type of contracted map that we want probably does include the highways and it probably looks to get rid of all these back roads and roads with street signs. Cool. 
So another thing to note that's very important is that we actually want multiple levels of these contracted graphs, right? The reason being that, um, you know, let's say I'm in the United States, I want to drive from New York to California. For those of you who are not living in the United States, New York and California are on opposite sides of the country. It is a very, very long drive and takes about a week. If I want to run Dijkstra's on that, it's just not possible, right? And on the other hand, if I wanted to just go and stay within New York, that might be a little bit easier. And if I wanted to drive 10 minutes from my house, that might be even easier. So the gist is we can actually have multiple levels of uh, graphs that are increasingly sparse so that we can uh, make our search space a little bit better, right? So again, the idea is uh, if we have a ton of contractions, it's probably just gonna end up being major highways, which makes a lot of sense, right? Like if you had a map, a physical map, and you know this was back in the 1950s and you're driving from one place to the other, you probably weren't looking for back roads. You were just looking from highway to highway to get you to the general area that you were in. And then finally, once you get very close, you can look at all those back roads and get to your exact location. Cool. And then the idea here is just, again, no back roads, uh, which potentially might lose us a little bit of time here and there if we encounter some traffic on the highway. Uh, but ultimately, it is going to make it such that we have a much smaller Dijkstra's algorithm to run. And as a result, we can actually fetch our route in some reasonable amount of time. Cool. So let's actually take an example of a graph traversal that might go on. So the first thing is, here's our start point. Here's our end point. Let's imagine that this is actually a pretty far distance apart, maybe a few miles. So just running typical Dijkstra's algorithm over the entire graph is not going to be feasible. Instead, we have to actually use our sparse graph in order to get us there. And our sparse graph only contains these nodes with the boxes in them, right, and the edges connecting them, because those are going to be the kind of important roads that ultimately are going to get us to the majority of places that we want to go. So let's imagine my start node is right over here. The first thing that I want to do is actually go ahead and do one, a Dijkstra search to any of the nodes in the sparse map. So I can do that pretty easily. I just run a Dijkstra on my non-compacted graph. And because in theory, there should be a sparse node uh, close enough to us, it shouldn't be too bad of a search, right? So maybe I've got one result over here and maybe this takes me three minutes to get there. And then if I decided to take a left over here and go up, maybe this route takes me eight minutes. Similarly, uh, from our end position, we also want to do the same thing. We want to take another uh, Dijkstra's algorithm and find the closest points in that sparse map. So let's say, you know, we're uh, one minute away from this guy over here and we're four minutes away from this guy over here. And, you know, perhaps something like uh, seven minutes from this guy over here. Then from there, we have a variety of start points and end points that we can actually get to. And what we can now do is just run a Dijkstra search on the sparse map. And so by doing that, uh, we can actually find the distance between these various sparse points uh, or their start point in the sparse map and the variety of endpoints in the sparse map. And then once we calculate all of those distances, we can just go ahead and take the minimum, which is great because that is going to allow us to use a significantly smaller amount of uh, searches in order to get the result that we want. Otherwise, uh, this would be a massive distance. You know, we would have a bunch of points all the way through here and we would have to check all of them, right? That's very inconvenient. Cool. So the next point that I want to make, because uh, it's pretty easy to learn about contraction hierarchies, but uh, one emphasis that I always like to make in these videos is actually, you know, the systems assigned choices, right? What database do we want to use for our data? So as far as the base graph goes, I think ideally we would probably want to use a graph database. When I say the base graph, I mean the uncontracted one, right? So literally just all of the nodes, all of the edges. The reason I say use a graph database is because probably storing this memory is going to be out of question. Uh, it's pretty huge and that would be really expensive to keep it all in memory. And the reason I say a graph database is because we have to run traversals. And so even though you could do something known as a non-native graph database, so for example, you know, you would use a many-to-many -many relationship in a SQL database to represent edges, that ultimately is going to be relatively slow. The reason being that if we wanted to do that, the way we would represent an edge is by using an index over the ID on a directed edge or something like that. And the problem with that is that that table is actually going to get slower as our data set grows in size. Because indexes basically rely on just sorting things by the ID, uh, in order to find something in a sorted list, we have to binary search it. And if we have to binary search it, that is a logarithmic algorithm relative to the size of the list. 
and as that list grows bigger, our traversals go slower. On the contrary, something like Neo4j is known as a native graph database, which basically means that it actually uses pointers to all of the nodes on disk uh, to help represent edges, and as a result of that, uh, every single jump from one node to another via an edge is going to be in constant time as opposed to logarithmic time. So even if we have a huge data set, things in theory should not get slower. So the next question is what should we actually do with our sparse graphs? Well, ultimately we should probably store them in Neo4j. However, these things are technically smaller, and if they're small enough, perhaps it is actually feasible to store them in memory. The reason I say this is because of the fact that these sparse graphs are probably going to be used in a lot of the queries, right? Uh, obviously, um, you know, we're always going to have to use the base map because it's unlikely that our start and end point are in one of the sparse graphs. However, uh, we're probably going to have a lot of partitions of that base graph, whereas, you know, for our sparse maps, we may have fewer partitions, so all of those partitions are probably going to be accessed quite a bit more. And so we want to keep those read speeds as quick as possible, and keeping them in memory or effectively caching them could be very, very useful for us there. So again, we could keep a backup in Neo4j, but depending on how many shards we have, uh, keeping these guys in memory could be very, very huge for us. Cool. The next thing I want to touch upon is partitioning, because I just started to mention that. So the first thing that we should note is uh, we probably do want to be partitioning by geohash. So I've covered geohashes plenty in the past, um, and so I don't really want to go into them too much in this video. I'd highly recommend looking at the Yelp video that I made recently or the Uber video that I made uh, if you want uh, more information on those. But the general idea of a geohash is that we basically split our map into many different pieces. And basically, the geohash is an ID assigned to every single point in our database, such that points that are close to one another have very similar geohashes, which make them feasible for range queries if we're actually looking for close points uh, from a given point in our database. And so by partitioning by geohash, we know that typically, you know, if I'm going to run a, a Dijkstra search, I'm going to do so starting with the points that are closest to me. So partitioning by geohash is going to ensure that the majority of my Dijkstra search is going to occur on the partition that my start point is located on. So ideally that should be very useful. The problem with partitioning by geohash is that objectively, certain ones of these uh, partitions are going to get more traffic, right? Like in Oklahoma over here versus New York City, there is a pretty significant difference in terms of how much traffic you're going to be getting because there are a lot more users in New York City using Google Maps compared to Oklahoma. There's a pretty small population. And that's assuming that we're using you know, equal geohash sizes. So what you could do is a couple of things. For one, you could dynamically size uh, our geohash partitions, right? So rather than using this whole big box right here, New York City is just a very small box, and that way you end up getting pretty even load between these two. Another option that you have is for the most part, these things are gonna be read only. And so what we could do is actually go ahead and uh, you know just add more replicas for the hot partitions. So you know maybe this guy over here in Northeast America, which is going to get a lot more traffic, could have 20 replicas, and o Oklahoma maybe has two. Now, for what it's worth, I did say that these are read-only partitions, but the truth is that they're not. We do eventually have to update the weights of the graph with how long it takes to actually traverse a given road, especially as incoming traffic data comes in. And so having a ton of replicas is not necessarily the most convenient thing uh, if we want to be able to update those semi-easily. Of course, it's a trade-off, but we can discuss that one later. Cool. The next thing I want to talk about is actually going to be updating ETAs, because this is where things start to really get tricky. So I guess the general idea here is that we can start to figure out the speed of a driver and actually update the weights of our graph according to it. Right, so let's imagine that uh, you know I have the following road. I've got this guy length one, this guy length one, this guy length one, this guy length one. So it takes one minute to drive on all of those roads. And all of a sudden, we have a car accident right here. And now instead of taking one, it takes time six. Now note that we had a, short, uh, a shortcut edge on this road before, right? This guy right here, which previously had time four. Now all of a sudden, that shortcut edge has time nine because we just added five to this segment over here. However, if we actually look at it, there's actually going to be a shorter path from our start point to our end point by taking this guy over here. This is only going to have a time of length eight. And so as a result, the question is, what do we do about our shortcut edge 
now that we actually have to update our ETA. So this is all going to be a part of the challenge of updating our ETA and we're going to go through all of the steps of actually figuring that out. Cool. So the first thing is actually going to be calculating how fast a driver is going. So even though modern phones do tend to have accelerometers, they can't just automatically calculate your speed. You do have to use a couple of GPS signals and then, you know, get the displacement over time, right? So if I have a GPS ping and it gives me a lot long, and then it also uh, gives me the timestamp associated with that GPS ping, basically what we would do is say, you know, distance over time is equal to velocity. And then that's how fast our car is actually going to be moving. Cool. So then the question is, well, okay, now we have a value that we've gotten for how fast we're moving, but what road are we actually on, right? Because ultimately we need to attribute the speed to a particular edge in our graph or else it's useless to us. We need to update the, the edge on that graph. So this is not something I want to go too in depth on because uh, I already have in the Uber video and it took me about 30 minutes to do. But if you recall, we can basically model this problem with a hidden Markov model where every single road has a certain transition probability Right, so if I'm on one road, there's a certain probability that I'm going to stay on that road. There's a probability that I'm going to switch to another road. And then every road also has an emission probability for seeing a GPS signal. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why do we need this? GPS signals from phones are imperfect. So we might get this GPS signal right here, and we actually don't know if it's coming from this road on the left or this road on the right. However, it, right after that, if we happen to get this GPS signal, number two, uh, we're pretty confident that it was probably from this road over here because it's unlikely that if you're going down this path, all of a sudden you're over here. And so that's what our hidden Markov model is going to help us to determine, is basically the probability that we're on a given road given a variety of incoming GPS signals. So this is again something that I covered very much in depth in the Uber video, but the gist is that we need to basically keep that sharded hidden Markov model on a bunch of instances of Flink because uh, in order to efficiently process a hidden Markov model, we need to use the Viterbi algorithm, which is a dynamic programming algorithm, meaning it has to maintain state from point to point, right? So when point two comes in, I have to actually remember where point one was, uh, otherwise it's not going to be very useful to me. So we basically need to keep track of our state of our hidden Markov model as points keep coming in. And uh, at least the way that I proposed doing that was using Kafka and Flink and basically uh, partitioning Flink by geohash range so that when we get two GPS signals that are near one another, they go to the same Flink node. Again, not something I want to go too much into. You can watch the whole video on it, but uh, that's the general overview. The next thing is we actually want to be able to calculate the average road speed, right? So it's one thing to be able to get a single driver's speed. However, it's another thing to actually get the average speed of all of the drivers on that road. Now let's say we want to do this process, I don't know, every 10 minutes or every five minutes and actually just bunch them all together, get that average, and then we can throw that onto our edge and update the amount of time that it takes to traverse the road. Cool. So in order to do that, obviously we need to maintain some state because we're actually going to be taking the average of these numbers. So the way that we can do this is, of course, as per usual with Jordan, we're going to be using Kafka and Flink because we're going to be doing stream processing. We're going to aggregate these entries using a linked list on a five minute interval. And what we can do is actually partition all of this data by the edge ID, which is effectively just the ID of the road. We get the ID of the road from that previous step using our hidden Markov model. So now all of a sudden, you know, our Flink node is basically just going to be keeping the following. We've got a linked list of all of the speeds, right? 22 is pointing to 25 mile an hour, 28 mile an hour, 20 miles per hour. Uh, and then we can also cache the number of entries that there are and the number uh, of total miles per hour that we're seeing. Uh, the reason for this being that this is just an efficient algorithm to quickly get the average, right? So for me to get the average, I just do 95 divided by four. Um, that's a percentage sign, geez, I'm tired. And so the, the point here is that, you know, you can quickly compute the average when a new entry comes in, let's say uh, 21, entry, uh, 21 miles an hour comes in, then we would say entries is now five. The total is now going to be, uh, let's see, 116. 
and then if we needed to compute the average, we could quickly do so. Similarly, if uh, the 20 miles per hour was outside of the active time range, right, it's older than five minutes, we can remove it from our linked list very easily because it's at the edge of it, and that's gonna be O of one for removing. We can subtract the number of entries by one, now we're back to four, and now all of a sudden we are back to 96 in terms of our total. So hopefully you understand my rationale behind uh, basically algorithmically efficient uh, data structures in Flink here for calculating that average. Cool, the next aspect of this is going to be the concept of bubbling up, right? So the idea here is that if we have a shortcut road, and the shortcut road is made up of a variety of individual real roads, if one of those real roads all of a sudden gets a ton of traffic on it, we may want to update that shortcut edge because all of a sudden we don't want all of our cars being routed through that traffic, we'd like to route them elsewhere. So keep in mind that not only can we have a road right here, we can have a shortcut edge that depends on it, and we can even have a second shortcut edge that depends on the first one because like I mentioned, if we have multiple different layers of sparse graphs, we may actually want to take shortcut edges and make shortcut edges out of them, which is pretty interesting. Cool. So again, the idea here is the ETA is constantly changing, right? Like I said, every couple of minutes, maybe even every few seconds, depending on how you configure things, you're going to be updating the ETA of this particular road right here. But ideally, we don't want to have to constantly be recalculating all of our shortcut edges because that's just going to be a complex process. It's a lot of Dijkstra searching. So the question is, when should we check when we should actually update a shortcut edge? Ideally, we should just do it if uh, this guy increases by some delta, and then it leads to the shortcut edge in turn having an ETA increase by some threshold, right? So if shortcut one happens to go from 10 minutes to 12 minutes in terms of the estimated amount of time to drive through it, maybe perhaps we should look to see if we can use a different uh, sequence of roads to recompute shortcut one for the same start and endpoint. Cool, so let's continue talking about actually doing some bubbling up. So the first thing that I wanna do is uh, basically create a database of dependencies as far as shortcut edges are concerned. So imagine we have some edge called 12, right? So that's the idea of the edge, and we create a shortcut edge that includes it, and that eventually gets given the ID 46. Now keep in mind that shortcut edges have multiple dependencies, right? So 46 is here again, this time it depends on edge 13, and look at that, it happens to also depend on edge 14. Now note that if uh, we have this even bigger shortcut edge called 197, it could depend on 12, 13, 14, and possibly even you know, 15, 16, 17. And the point is we want to be able to keep track of these dependencies so that we know to update shortcut edges when we get a new ETA of basically uh, one of our actual roads or our actual edges. So for this type of thing, I don't think we're gonna be updating it too frequently, so I think it's pretty reasonable to just use a typical MySQL database. Uh, again, reads don't have to be super fast on it, writes don't have to be super fast on it because they're not gonna come in that often. And frankly, I don't even wanna read from this database table. The reason I'm keeping a database table in the first place is because I ultimately want to pipe all of this data into our Flink, uh, into our Flink node from over here. So we can actually use change data capture to basically pipe all of that data into Flink and then say, oh, wait a second, you just got an update on road 12. I'm looking over here, I see that 46 depends on 12 and 197 depends on 12. Looks like we're gonna have to update those values as well. So how is this actually going to look like from the perspective of a diagram? Let's check it out. So like I mentioned before, our full graph, right, the non-compacted one at all is going to use Neo4j. I'm sure this is gonna have a ton of partitions, but for now I'm just representing it as one. We've also got our sparse graph, which is in memory, and then we've also got our super sparse graph, which is in memory. Now I'm sure the sparse graph probably will need a few different partitions. Maybe if we're lucky, the super sparse graph can only be stored on one partition, uh, but hard to say without actually doing this type of thing in practice. So. The first thing to note is that again, we've got Flink down here in the middle of our graph because this is where all of the updates are coming in. So keep in mind that Flink knows from the prior example, if we're just continuing that, that road 12 is part of both road 46 and 197. Cool. Then it's also getting speed updates from Kafka, right? Basically we have our service from before, that hidden Markov service, uh, putting speed updates for a given road ID into Kafka and Flink can be partitioned on the road ID so that you know, for a given road, we're making sure it's receiving all of those speed updates. So in the last five minutes, 
let's say we see that uh, one car is going 10 miles an hour on road 12, one car is going 8 miles per hour on road 12. So now, all of a sudden, our 5 minute timer hits, we want to actually update our edge. Great. So the first thing that we do is we go to the full graph and we say, okay, road 12 is now getting 9 miles an hour. The next thing that we do is we're actually going to go to our sparse graph in memory and do the same thing because we know that 46 is in the sparse graph. So we have to say, hey, you know, road 12 is going 9 miles an hour. Update the edge uh, for the ETA of road 46, uh, respectively. And the next thing is that we also want to be uh, updating our super sparse graph because that's where road 197 is. So now we're going to say, uh, hey, road 12 is 9 miles an hour. Or rather than do that, you know, we would just basically say, you know, 196 is going up by, you know, two minutes or something because we can keep track of how long uh, road 12 is and then we just multiply the delta of the speed with the length of the road. Cool. So the next thing that we're going to do there is basically to say, okay, well, shoot, all of a sudden, uh, road 46 just became a lot slower. Now I have to find a new path for it. So the way that we would actually find a new path for road 46 is we would take the two points that road 46 was connecting, right? So let's imagine this was 46 and it has some start and some end. Now all of a sudden we actually go to the full graph because the full graph is going to have all the different roads between these same two points, right? You know, we've got all of these different ways of getting there. And so now that's going to return us basically the best possible way that we can re uh, recreate that shortcut edge. And then once we do that, we can actually go right over to here in the shortcut dependencies table and update that. So let's say now all of a sudden, you know, road 46 is no longer dependent on road 12, but is now dependent on road 9 and road 16. This change is going to pipe through our change data capture. We're going to see that road 12 is no longer a part of road 46 in Flink. And then all of a sudden we can cross that out. And so now whenever we get subsequent updates to the speed of road 12, we are not going to be doing any updates over here. Hopefully that makes some general sense. Okay, so the last part of this as my throat begins to kill me is just going over the full design once more. Right over here, we've got our driver where the first thing that they want to do is actually go ahead and calculate their route. So like we just showed above, there are three different tables that they can go to. There's the full map for close distances, there's the sparse map for medium distances, there's the super sparse map for large distances. Now I haven't shown off how we're actually partitioning any of these tables, but ideally they are going to be partitioned by their geohash, use single leader replication, and of course if they're particularly hot partitions, we can either add a bunch of replicas or you know, treat particularly hot partitions and split them out so that, for example, New York City is on its own partition, but then all of the middle of the United States is also on its own partition. Cool, hopefully that part makes sense. The next piece of that is once we're actually driving, we want to be uh, hitting our traffic update service. So the point here is that this guy is constantly sending pings via GPS signals. Now the first thing that this is gonna do is go into Kafka and subsequently into Flink. Now this is where we're going to bring back in the service that we introduced in our Uber video, which is going to be all of our road transition and emission probabilities so that we can basically calculate a GPS signal and then convert it to a road ID. And then now all of a sudden we can basically say, oh, we have a given speed for that road ID and we're putting the speed for the road ID into Kafka. Now Kafka is very nice in the sense that it is going to do all of our uh, partitioning for us. And so assuming that we partition this guy by our road ID and our Flink consumer doing the same, now all of a sudden we can basically say, oh, okay, you know what, road 12 is now taking 10 minutes instead of its previous eight minutes. So now I can update all of the relevant things that care about 12. If uh, 12 is cared about by 46 and 197, we're gonna update over here in the super sparse map, we're gonna update over here in the sparse map, and we're gonna update road 12 over here in the full map. Then finally, we may have to do some actual edge recomputations if one of our shortcut edges took a while longer to calculate, at which point this guy would depend on this guy, this guy would depend on this guy, and then if they do end up calculating new edges, that would end up being propagated to our shortcut edge dependency MySQL table. We can just use single leader replication here. This isn't going to be happening that frequently. Again, we can do all of our partitioning by our short edge ID. Uh, just so that you know, it's nice and easy to pull all of those at once. 
And then finally, via change data capture and Kafka, those are all going to get piped back into our Flink for subsequent speed updates. All right, guys, I hope this was a decently good video. I think it is a major improvement over the last time I covered Google Maps in the sense that uh, I didn't really cover any of this stuff um, you know, regarding the shortcut edges and actually bubbling them up and propagating them and dealing with the ETAs. I just kind of briefly mentioned contraction hierarchies. And uh, when I did some more research, that seemed pretty uh, insufficient to me. Additionally, um, there are definitely other videos on YouTube out there who do cover this stuff, but I don't think they actually cover the implementation details of it. They just cover like a very high level algorithm. And uh, I think it's useful to kind of draw out how we would actually get this done. So guys, I hope you have a nice night. Uh, sorry for all the stuttering on my end. I'm freaking tired, but I will see you in the next one.